Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Backlog Busters, where I'm busting out my gaming backlog one video at a time and letting you know if after all these years, these games are worth playing today. In today's episode, we're defeating the evil whiz pig with the power of racing. In Diddy Kong Racing! Why after all these years am I going back to play Diddy Kong Racing? Well, this game was a suggestion from a friend when I asked for good games from the N64 era that I should feature on this channel. It felt like a good pick, as much like how Perfect Dark was a spiritual sequel to a seemingly more well-known GoldenEye, Diddy Kong Racing has a more well-known and successful cousin in Mario Kart 64. And much like my experience with Perfect Dark, I never played Diddy Kong Racing, but had a ton of exposure to Mario Kart 64 and every Mario Kart title since then. I've hardly played any kart racers that don't feature Mario. Sure, I played a bit of Kirby's Air Ride, if that counts, and a little bit of other random kart games of the years, but none seem to hold a candle to Mario in terms of popularity when friends want to play a quick multiplayer party game. Mario Kart always felt like the perfect game to me. It has a relatively simple set of controls, items that less experienced players can use to catch up, and it's easy to understand the rules, unlike something like Super Smash Bros., which is much more complicated and in my experience quickly scares off anyone casually trying to mess around once a competitive player shows up and starts disabling items and setting time limits. It's also a quick game that you won't be stuck into an hour-long virtual board game like Mario Party. So with a lifetime of Mario Kart experience, will Diddy Kong Racing change things up in an interesting way and pack in a ton of extra features like Rare did with Perfect Dark? Or will this just be another racer getting lapped by Mario and his buddies? <laughs> Diddy Kong Racing was developed by Rare who we've covered on this channel before, so I'll point you towards my video on Perfect Dark for more history on them as a company. The game, Diddy Kong Racing, was released for the N64 on November 21st, 1997 in Europe and Japan, followed shortly by the US release on November 24th of the same year. And this was only nine months after Mario Kart 64 released on the console, and was Rare's third game on the N64, following Killer Instinct Gold, Blast Core, and GoldenEye 007. It received high praise at the time, sitting in an 88 on Metacritic, with outlets comparing it to the recently released Mario Kart, like IGN. Diddy Kong Racing is an excellent follow-up to the somewhat controversial Mario Kart, improving on all of the game's weaknesses and inventing a few new additions of its own. It's the best kart game we've ever seen. I'm not sure what they mean by controversial, but other outlets took issue with the structure of the game. The GameStop review said, Artificially lengthening games by making you do the same thing over and over again is my vote for the worst trend in gaming, even though this is a much better game than Kart 64 ever was. And with that history out of the way, let's talk about what I liked about Diddy Kong Racing. Right from the start screen, the game shows off its best feature, the adventure mode. My interest immediately peaked as thinking back on the single player campaigns of the Mario Kart games, you're just racing the same tracks at 50, 100, 150, 200 cc, and so on, with more aggressive racers as the difficulty increases alongside your kart's speed, making turns more dangerous, and the number of items being thrown at you increase by what feels like 200% each time. Mario would never have the audacity to call that an adventure or story mode, because it's so bare bones. So what does Diddy Kong have to offer here? Well, it opens up with a cutscene that seems to imply that there might be a story here but it's sparse on details and saves all the heavy lifting for the manual, which explains the evil whiz pig has taken over, carved his face into the side of the mountain, and magically sealed off the race courses the island is known for. Timber the Tiger sends a letter asking for Diddy Kong's help, who comes running with a few other friends as well. The genie Taj has agreed to lend their help, but needs a racing champion who can challenge whiz pig. You're dropped into a hub world, where you have to actually drive around and explore level entrances. I was shocked. My fondest memories of mascot platformers and games in general from the N64 and PS1 eras are of hub worlds. Mario 64's castle, where you explore and leap into paintings. Gruntilda's lair in Banjo-Kazooie, where you leap into jigsaw puzzles, and many more. I adore a hub world, and somehow this driving game has one? Sure, it's not that large, and there are only a few secrets to find, but it just brought me such joy to explore and just gives the game a cohesive feel, which is something I've never seen in a kart racer before. These huge doors take you into different themed worlds, the first being Dino Domain. Each world has four racetracks that you'll need to complete, which earns you a balloon for each, allowing you to open the next race. 
After completing all the races, you'll challenge the boss, which is basically a one-on-one -on -one race with someone who doesn't use a vehicle and stomps on you. Luckily, you're able to fight back with items to slow them down and speed yourself up. Then you'll go back to the four races from before, and this time need to complete the race while collecting all seven silver coins, which are usually a little out of the main path, meaning you'll have to change up your entire strategy and route a bit to collect them while still getting first place. After which you'll challenge the boss again, who's decided to cheat more this time by knocking things over, running much faster than before, and in some cases, throwing obstacles in your way. But except for a few races that were frustratingly hard, I loved this adventure mode. The individual races were almost all a blast to play and having to change up your strategy to collect the silver coins after learning the track in a plane race requires you to look at all the levels in a different way as you try to find the best path and best lap in which to collect the coins you need. The boss levels can feel pretty cheap sometimes, but they were still a really cool idea for a car racer. I've got a lot of muscle memory from playing years of Mario Kart, so I did wonder how hard it would be to play something even slightly different, and was pleasantly surprised at how good this game feels to play. I did feel initially like the carts had less traction and things were maybe a little more slippery, but once I got used to it, it just seemed like the carts have more of a feeling of real weight to them than I would have expected for a game of this type or of this time. You've also got much more control over your drift options. You've got a normal drift by pulling the R button, which launches you out to the side you're leaning towards. This felt way more drastic than Mario Kart's little hop but immediately brought to mind memories of a PS3 kart racing game, Mod Nation Racers, which has an extremely similar drift that I loved at the time. You also have the option to hit the brakes while drifting, which does a sharp 90 degree turn and throws you up on two wheels, which I felt like at first was only helpful for maybe navigating the hub world or, or possibly in a battle mode. But in later races, you'll be using this around hairpin turns more often than I ever would have guessed. The level of control that you have over these carts is great, and it gives this game a unique feel with the variety of drifts allowing you to easily handle impossible looking turns. But it's clear from the title screen that Diddy and his friends will be driving more than just carts around this island, with a plane and a hovercraft both making an appearance. These all have the same basic drift, but gain additional features and have unique ways of controlling them both. The hovercraft, for instance, has mostly the same controls, but according to some tips I read, tapping the R button to hop around a turn will let you actually turn faster and not slide as much, which is very helpful in later races. And the plane uses the R button to do less of a drift, but more of a sharp turn, which makes the plane really touchy to control while you're holding it, but you'll need this to navigate tight tunnels, sharp turns, and complicated obstacles later on in the game. In addition to that, you'll gain the ability to do a barrel roll, as well as back flips and front flips, which all give you an extra bit of boost but were very difficult for me to pull off in the middle of a race, so I opted to play it safe and mostly just use the sharp turn more than any rolls or flips. I was extremely surprised at how different the races could feel when switching to the other vehicles, and how good these vehicles feel to control. I was convinced this plane was going to be awful to control, especially on an N64 controller, but I actually had a great time flying in this game. And the same can be said for the hovercraft, which manages to do a pretty convincing wave race impression. I think part of the reason they all feel so good is that the controls are 90% the same across all the vehicles, so you've got a bit of common ground and they just vary up a few mechanics between each. The tracks you'll race on have a lot of detail in their geometry with uneven terrain, multiple paths, islands jutting out of the water, and caverns with lots of outcroppings. They also are filled with fun touches like windmills, loop-de-loops, pirate ships, and more decorating the landscapes and serving as obstacles. And these levels have an incredible amount of detail compared to the ones in Mario Kart 64, which launched only nine months earlier and just appeared kind of flat with a lot more simple levels than the surprisingly detailed level geometry in Diddy Kong Racing. It feels like Rare looked at everything Mario Kart and wanted to put their own spin on it, like with the items. Where Nintendo used boxes, Rare actually uses balloons. Okay, so the real difference is how the items work. You don't get the item shuffle like in Mario Kart. You instead have a choice. Do you go for the red, blue, green, yellow, or rainbow balloon? One red balloon gives you a rocket that flies straight. The second red balloon gives you one homing missile. And the third gives you 10 non-homing missiles. 
And every time I got this item, it felt like too much power. A blue balloon gives you a speed boost like Mario Kart's mushroom. Picking up a second or third upgrades that boost. Green balloons give you an oil slick, then a mine, and finally a set of bubbles that trap other players. Yellow balloons give you a shield, then increase the shield's strength as you pick up the second and third of that balloon. Lastly, the rainbow balloon gives you a magnet that pulls you towards a player in front of you. The next upgrade increases the range at which it pulls you in, and the third actually pulls the player back towards you instead. Now, Mario Kart's random shuffle is probably better for a casual party game, but I really like this system because you can choose how offensive or defensive you'd like to be at any given time. It also adds an extra level of strategy in deciding whether to save your item to upgrade its power or fire it off immediately. Diddy Kong Racing is not a small game. You've got 16 racetracks to play through twice each, along with a boss in each world before you see the ending. I had a great time with almost all of the tracks in the game, and there's actually more to do after seeing the credits. If you want to see the rest of the game, you'll have to complete a series of tasks in each world. First, you'll need to collect a key that's been hidden in one of the tracks in each world, which basically unlocks a multiplayer non-race mode you'll need to win. After which, you'll be able to challenge the trophy race, which works like Mario Kart's cups in that you'll race through all the courses in the world, gaining points for each, for your finishing position, and hoping to come out on top. Doing this for all four worlds grants you access to an entirely new world with tracks to complete. Usually when I see a task like this, it doesn't seem worth it. But I was having such a good time with this game that I knocked out all these requirements and managed to get the second credit roll. At which point you'll unlock an entire second adventure, which mirrors all the existing tracks and mixes up the placement of the seven silver coins into positions that are much more difficult to collect while still finishing in first place. I did bounce off the game at this point, not because I didn't want to keep playing, but mainly because I needed to record this video. But I've still been getting the urge to go back and try to finish that second adventure now that I've unlocked it. This game is just filled with content, and if you like the gameplay, you'll love how much there is to do in this game. Now, there are some things that I did dislike about this game, starting with the hidden mechanics that aren't mentioned in the game at all, and I'm not convinced I would have ever learned naturally. The first is how to boost off the starting line, which, like Mario Kart, feels like it's supposed to be passed by word of mouth after someone in your party keeps stalling at the start and asks, how is everyone going so fast? Well, in Diddy Kong Racing, you'll need to hit the A button after the text says get ready, then starts to fade away, which will give you a boost. Then there are the boost pads and rings, which give you more boosts if you release the A button right before going over or through them. Even more confusing is that the same rule applies to any boost item you have. So just make sure to release the gas and you'll boost further after picking up any blue balloon. And don't you dare hit the A button again until your vehicle starts smoking. Not sure how I would have figured this one out, especially the part about pressing the A button again when smoke appears as I would have thought I needed to slow down or maybe drive through water to prevent the car from exploding. But so far these mechanics kind of line up with how later Mario Kart games have you tap the drift button over a hill or boost pad to get a bit of extra boost, which I don't think is explained in those games either. Then things get a little more obtuse, like how you lose no speed when drifting, so you should be drifting around every single turn, but make sure that you don't just hold the stick in the direction you're drifting, because then you'll lose control of the car. Instead, make sure to wiggle the stick away from the direction you're drifting occasionally to make sure that this doesn't happen. Unless you're on a straightaway, at which point you should be mashing the A button as fast as you can because that actually increases your top speed somehow. Unless you're in the hovercraft, where you'll apparently need to kind of drift back and forth very quickly like you're slaloming on skis. But I could never get this actually to work for me, it was just another of the many listings on Rare Gamer's Advanced Abilities page that contained all of these helpful mechanics, and I'll post in the show notes below. And none of this is ever covered in the game itself, which is fine if it's just added depth for competitive play, but as far as I could tell, the adventure mode requires the use of these abilities, as I really struggled on a few of the levels and only ever managed to beat them with the help of every ability I've covered here. I think this also limits the appeal of this as an alternative to Mario Kart 64, 
as anyone with knowledge of these abilities will blow right past anyone casually playing. And this feels more akin to a highly competitive Smash Brothers type multiplayer game, not one that anyone can hop in like Mario Kart. Speaking of struggling on levels, some of these difficulty walls just came out of nowhere. I blew through the first world, first boss, the first seven silver coin challenges, but then the second Triceratops boss fight opened up and stumped me for probably an hour or more. I tried over and over with no luck, then went to another world, completed several races, and came back and still couldn't beat the Triceratops. Eventually searching out tips and tricks videos and articles for any hint at how to win this race, because the Triceratops just cheats. Knocking things over, stomping on you, it's so different than a normal racetrack too with this big spiraling tower. But I didn't realize how much of the hidden mechanics of the game were needed for this race. In addition to needing every item in the level to stall the dino and boost past it. Completing this race with all the new hidden mechanics I learned did make me much better at the game, and none of the other boss fights really gave me that much trouble after this. I did hit another difficulty spike on this later level that took multiple nights of attempts to win. But while this only happened a few times throughout the game, they were incredibly frustrating races, and for a few of them, I thought I might never beat this game and would just have to move on to another, as you'll need to complete every level in the first four worlds to see the ending. There are just a few levels here that felt inconsistent and randomly spiked the difficulty like this, throwing off the otherwise smooth difficulty curve. Lastly, as much as I enjoyed the levels themselves from a racing and overall complexity perspective, I do think that within each world it's pretty hard to pick out an individual racetrack. The worlds give them an overall theme that ties them together, but it makes the levels kind of blur together visually. I don't think anything is ugly here, most are bright and vibrant, but when I compare this suite of racetracks to the Mario Kart 64 ones, I think Diddy Kong just ends up looking a little too generic race to race while Mario's levels I think are much more memorable and visually interesting in some cases. Now, with all that in mind, how did I feel about this game overall, and would I recommend Diddy Kong Racing as a game that should be on your backlog? On the good side, the adventure mode was a blast to play, and really unique compared to Mario Kart's cup structure. The racing mechanics still hold up really well no matter if you're in a plane, hovercraft, or just a normal kart. The tracks are all detailed and fun to navigate, and while items aren't the most unique, the way you upgrade them and can use them more strategically is. And if you finish the game and just can't get enough, there's a whole second adventure out there, which while it is the same levels, changes things up enough that I had to force myself to stop playing and come record this video. On the bad side though, the game doesn't seem interested in letting you know some of its most important mechanics, and you will need them to compete with the other racers around the island. Plus there are some difficulty spikes that came up that caused me quite a bit of stress and there's not any way to just skip a level and move on and still complete the game. Also, the racetracks can start to blend together a little bit as multiple tracks with the same theme go by. This all comes together to form a recommendation of yes. As someone who's always enjoyed kart racing games in multiplayer and party settings, having a game with more depth, great controls, really fun levels, and legitimately the best single player kart racing experience I've ever played, this feels like a game that deserves to be on your backlog, if you at all enjoy games in this genre or style of game. If you don't like the gameplay, I could see the adventure mode feeling repetitive to some, but for me it was something I didn't know I wanted. And yes, there were a few levels that really discouraged me, but after taking a break and calming my nerves, I managed to complete absolutely everything in the first adventure, and will most likely be going back to play more of the second adventure in my spare time. What I thought might just be an enjoyable distraction from Mario Kart has turned out to be so much more, and I'm really glad I went back to play this. Now, Nintendo and or Rare, please make a follow-up entry. Why is this left in the dust? And even though I came out very positive on this game, I'll throw out my normal message that my opinion on this game is not meant to tarnish any fond memories you have of playing this, and if you loved or still love this game, please tell me why in the comments below. I'd love to hear about your experience and talk more about the parts I really liked as well. If you're interested in playing this game, there are no modern options available, which I assume is due to Rare being owned by Microsoft and Nintendo's characters being used throughout the game, so you've got the original N64 version that sadly hasn't ever shown up on Nintendo's virtual console services through the years, and is still unavailable to this day other than its original cartridge. 
There was a remake slash port to the Nintendo DS, which added some new maps, modes, and multiplayer options, as well as uses for the touchscreen. But in my short time playing the DS version, the D-pad made the game feel less easy to control than the original game, which uses a full control stick. And this came out in 2007, long after Rare had been bought by Microsoft. Please, Nintendo, at least port this to the Switch's N64 catalog so more people can play this game today because it's so much fun. And again, if Rare or Nintendo wants to revisit this in a sequel, I'd take that too. But that's it for this episode of Backlog Busters. Have you played Diddy Kong Racing? What did you think? Is it a must-play game in your opinion? Does it deserve to be on others' backlogs? Let me know in the comments below. I'd love to talk more about it. And if you have any suggestions for a game that I should clear off my backlog next, I'll work to make a video on it. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the little thumbs up button and subscribe. And if you want to get alerted whenever I get done editing my next video, don't forget to hit the little bell icon. And as always, thank you all so much for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.